Today at the National Press Club, Australian Olympic Committee President John Coates. Mr Coates helped steer the Olympic movement through the postponed Games in Tokyo. At the same time, he helped bring the Games back to Australia, with Brisbane's successful bid for 2032. John Coates at the National Press Club of Australia. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club Westpac Address. I'm the club's president, Laura Tingle. Because of continuing lockdowns in Canberra, Melbourne and Sydney, I'm welcoming you from the ABC studios in Canberra and our guest today, Australian Olympic Committee President John Coates, is speaking to us from the ABC studios in Sydney. The title of Mr Coates' address, address today is Tokyo and Beyond. Having successfully steered Brisbane's bid for the 2032 Olympics, the upcoming Winter Olympics in China and his extensive links into sports across Australia, I anticipate lots of questions about both the Olympics and sports administration in Australia more broadly. John Coates, welcome to the Virtual National Press Club. Thank you, Laura. Uh, members of the National Press Club, thank you for hosting me today. I acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to the elders, both past and present. For those in Canberra, I pay my respects to the Ngunnawal people. Today I'll speak about Tokyo, Afghanistan, Beijing and Brisbane, doing so as both the President of the Australian Olympic Committee and Vice President of the International Olympic Committee. And I'll conclude by sharing five insights gathered in 45 years of Olympic involvement since Montreal in 1976. But starting with Tokyo, friends, at the AOC annual general meeting in 2020, I opined that the delayed Tokyo Games could be the greatest Olympics of all time. Coronations of the kind given to Sydney in 2000 by then AOC President Samaranch are rare. And history will decide Tokyo's place. But consider the achievement of hosting the Games in a once-in-a-century global pandemic and doing so amidst loud calls for cancellation. Calls I understood but disagreed with. Because the IOC, Tokyo Organising Committee, Japanese government, the host city of Tokyo and the World Health Organisation all had confidence in a safe Games. I personally believe the Games could proceed safely because of the detail in the risk assessment and mitigation procedures. What this meant was that if the Games were cancelled, it would be for fear and not fact, because of anxiety and not reason. Thankfully, the Games proceeded in the first Olympic bubble in history with no spectators at venues, with 85% of athletes and officials vaccinated, with 767,000 COVID-19 screening tests and 464 positive cases, of which 157 were non-Japanese residents, such that if the Olympic Village were a country, it would have been the fourth most vaccinated nation in the world and the global leading, leader in daily testing. Friends, all of this made possible 339 events, including new events for younger people and some returning older events, yielding 2,401 medals won by athletes from 93 National Olympic Committees more than any other Games and participated in by teams with 49% women and 51% men. The global reach was also an historic high. For Games broadcasters, it was their biggest of ever digital event. There were more than 175 million unique users on the Olympic web and Olympic app. That's double the traffic of Rio 2016. IOC and Tokyo 2020 social posts generated more than 5 billion engagements. There were 250 million cheers of support from all over the world. And streaming platforms broke records with Tokyo 2020 now referred to as the streaming games. All evidence that Tokyo delivered necessary distraction for some, compelling inspiration for many more, and I like to think hope for all 
during some global sadness and apprehension. From the Australian perspective, it was hugely successful with the third largest Olympic team of 486 athletes. Australia won 46 medals, finishing sixth. Women comprised 53.7% of our team. And our 179 Paralympians won 80 medals from the 539 events and finishing eighth. And so if success is measured by the extent to which one achieves their vision, noting the vision of the IOC is to build a better world through sport, then it must be the case that Tokyo achieved as much as any other games with more impact than every other games. That's why I believe Tokyo hosted the greatest Olympic Games of all. I also offer a special commendation to the Japanese people because they hosted an Olympic Games they could not attend. And that is as gracious as one can be. Turning to Afghanistan, on September the 8th, IOC President Thomas Bach revealed the IOC had helped around 100 members of the Olympic community in Afghanistan leave the country on humanitarian visas. These rescue efforts, which began after the Tokyo Games and before the Taliban took control, are continuing. There is a special focus on women and girls, as they may be more at risk. It involves Olympic partners working with national Olympic committees, international federations, NGOs and IOC members. The IOC has also made humanitarian visa applications to the Australian government for two athletes and three officials and their families. And our member sports have committed to assist with employment and settlement. At this moment, the existing National Olympic Committee of Afghanistan remains recognised as the only such committee in Afghanistan. Mindful these officials were democratically elected in April 2018. Friends, what happens next is still to be determined. The IOC is alert to recent statements from the Taliban's Cultural Commission that women's sport was neither appropriate nor necessary. I'll say no more on this at the moment other than again stating that the Olympic Charter requires National Olympic Committees to adhere to the principles of non-discrimination. Noting that in 1999, Afghanistan was suspended and excluded from the 2000 Games in Sydney. Turning to Beijing. Next year's Winter Olympics in Beijing open on February 4, just four months away. They'll be challenged by COVID, but readied by the learnings from Tokyo. The Winter Games will go ahead without spectators from overseas, with tickets limited to supporters living in China. The Chinese government and Beijing Organising Committee have announced that only fully vaccinated participants are exempt from a 21-day quarantine unless there is justified medical exemption. All fully, uh, fully vaccinated participants will enter a closed loop management and transport system immediately upon their arrival. This system will stay in place until the Paralympic Winter Games close on March 13. The Australian Olympic Committee will take 41 athletes to Beijing and Paralympics Australia will take nine athletes and two guides. guides. The Games are proceeding amidst some low-level speculation regarding boycotts and sanctions. I will share the AOC and IOC perspective, noting that at the 71st session of the General Assembly of the United Nations, a consensus resolution called upon future hosts of Games and other member states to include sport as appropriate in conflict prevention activities and to ensure the effective implementation of the Olympic truce during the Games. This means that the United Nations has expressed confidence in the power of sport to bring about social change, as is the Olympic vi vision. Uh, following on from this, the 
IOC released a statement that the Olympic Games are the only event that brings the entire world together in peaceful competition. In our fragile world, the power of sport to bring the world together, despite all the existing differences, gives us all hope for a better future. IOC President Thomas Bach declared that the IOC is not a super world government, nor will it act like one. President Bach went further expressing, a boycott of the Olympic Games has never achieved anything. I agree. There are many who um, have supported sanctions and boycotts in the past. The Americans boycotted in Moscow, uh, Moscow in 1980. The Australian Olympic Federation, as we there, uh, were then known, um, did not. I add that I was the administration director for that Australian team in 1980. And then, of course, the Soviet Union and others boycotted Los Angeles in 1984. My view is this. Having athletes from 206 National Olympic Committees and from the IOC Refugee Olympic Team united in competition, living together, exchanging opinions, sharing their life stories and dreams, that really matters. What matters even more is the rest of the world is watching this. Watching how the Olympics creates an atmosphere of friendship, of understanding, of respect and of solidarity. Further, as an Australian, it's a badge of honour that only Australia and Greece have attended every Games since 1896. To Brisbane 2032, when the Prime Minister of Australia, Premier of Queensland, Lord Mayor of Brisbane and I made the final bid for Brisbane to host the Olympics, we were pitching into a new era of how Olympics are planned, built and hosted. This new era ensures Brisbane's bid is affordable. Brisbane will re rely on existing venues for 85% of competition, with the remaining venues either being upgraded or in the planning stage, regardless of the Games. Unlike host cities in the past, the Olympics will not be the sole reason for new development projects. Instead, South East Queensland's 20-year current infrastructure and urban development plan will accelerate because of the Games. The operating cost for the Brisbane Olympics and Paralympic Games is projected to be four 0.94 billion Australian dollars, including an 18% contingency of 808 million. The IOC contribution is 1.4 billion, plus 188 million from its hospitality program. Domestic sponsorship will target 1.7 billion for six years' rights for Games and Australian Olympic Team associations. And ticket sales will generate 1.3 billion with licensed products, donations and other revenues to break even. The 2032 Games will also be the first with a, a, a hub and spoke model. Benefits will reach across South East Queensland, including the Gold and Sunshine Coasts, Redland Bay, Ipswich, Toowoomba and the Scenic Rim. And Cairns, Townsville, Melbourne and Sydney will host group qualifying events and cities across Queensland will host teams acclimatising and preparing. The Games are modelled to deliver $8.1 billion in economic benefits to Queensland, including a $4.6 billion boost in tourism and trade and $3.5 billion in social improvements. The chair of the Coordination Commission will be five-time Olympian and two-time Olympic swimming champion Kirsty Coventry from Zimbabwe, the most decorated Olympian from her continent and leader of a commission where women represent 66% of the membership. Coordinating a Brisbane Games is another wonderful global festival hosted by Australia. 
Turning finally to some observations I share after 45 years of involvement with the Games. First, Australia has had a total of 60 Indigenous Olympians, including 16 in Tokyo and three medalists. They are some of the greatest athletes, most outstanding people and dear friends. Put simply, we need more. We need more Indigenous representation on and off the field, which is why the AOC's Athletes Commission welcomed Alex Winwood as the first Indigenous member elected following this year's changes to the AOC's constitution, guaranteeing a permanent Aboriginal and a permanent Torres Strait Islander voice on the Commission. Why we are consulting with the AOC Indigenous community regarding a second appointment. If we've got one, we need now to have the Torres Strait Islander. We need further inclusion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait, Torres Strait Islander customs and protocols in AOC events. Why we need to promote more stories of Indigenous Olympians and why the Brisbane Olympics will create a new norm for Olympics where First Nations and contemporary cultures are celebrated as co-contributors to the Games. It is the case that considerable progress has been made as referenced. More than a quarter of the number of all Indigenous Olympians in history competed in Tokyo. But the arc of history needs to bend further and sooner creating more opportunity for Indigenous champions in all walks of life. Second, every organisation, even ones with long histories and important values, must adapt. There is no thriving without adaptation. It was not long ago that the Olympics connoted athlete prow prowess, but also bureaucratic largesse, expensive bids, and dubious legacies for some host cities. That's all changed as it needed to. Facilitated by a rejuvenated IOC, a not-for-profit civil international organisation redistributing more than 90% of its income to sports. That means every day the equivalent of 3.4 million US dollars goes to help athletes and sports organisations at every level around the world. My third insight is that in the age of social media, it's easy for truth to be distorted and for terrible damage to be done. I echo the recent remarks of the Prime Minister in this regard. Social media voices may be right or they may be wrong, but the truth tends to be found in data and in evidence. Those protesting the holding of the Tokyo Games were arguably the loudest voice and what a tragedy it would have been if the Games did not proceed. So I submit that all of us must pay strict attention to evidence behind an opinion rather than merely the opinion itself. And so strength to the arms of the members of the National Press Club as serious journalism faces its own challenges from less informed but very loud social media competitors. Fourth, uh, it is the case that Australians are a much-loved people the world over. We are regarded as a leader in the ongoing democratic experiment, as a haven for people from all over the world. The rest of the world is impressed by a small population producing so many great scientists, business leaders, athletes, artists, tech giants and so on. More importantly, the way we tend to achieve things attracts much respect. And the role of Australian Olympians and Paralympians in this is significant. Herb Elliott, Cathy Freeman, Dawn Fraser, Patty Mills, Ian Thorpe, Louise Savage, Dylan Alcott, Ash Barty and so many others present the Australian character to the world in a way which serves every Australian well. I walk into boardrooms around the world standing atop the shoulders of these giants, proud to be an Australian and welcomed as such. And so I observe that every Aussie abroad and at home would do well to channel their 
in a herb or they're in a kathy. Um, my final insight is that as imperfect as the world is, stumbling from one generation's challenge to the next, sport can always inspire hope. From people in the favelas of Rio, basketball in Los Angeles, running in Africa, boxing in Cuba, AFL, rugby league and union, swimming and tennis in Australia, gymnastics in China, cricket in Delhi and Cape Town, or wheelchair rugby for wonderful war veterans. Friends, since 1896, there have been two world wars, one cold war, two financial crises, multiple pandemics, and geopolitical tensions of all sorts. And since Edwin Flack took leave from his accountant's job in London and travelled to Athens in 1896 to compete in the colours of his school and club, Old Melburnians, sport has been an international language of hope spoken at every Olympics and Paralympics. And may it ever be so. I thank you and welcome any questions. Thanks so much, Mr Coates. Um, if I could start just taking up a few of the bits of your speech. Um, you talk about your 45 years uh, involvement in uh, the Olympics. You talked about the change that came about in Beijing because of streaming. Uh, and you talked about the uh, economics of the Brisbane Games. And I just wondered, uh, it remains a bit of an opaque area for a lot of people outside to understand, you know, that the whole power process of the Olympics. You've talked about a rejuvenated uh, IOC. Um, there's a new future of uh, future host commission process that Brisbane's the first exercise in. Can you explain to us why you're very confident that those days of the really expensive bids uh, and the dubious leg legacies are over? I am. The, um, the IOC comprises um, between 100 and 115 members. They, um, 70 of them, uh, are appointed by the IOC as the IOC's representative in a particular territory or country. Fifteen are uh, presidents of international federations, fifteen are presidents of national Olympic committees and fifteen are elected by the athletes themselves at each Olympic Games. So that's a broad base. Now, President Bach uh, recently announced this coordination commission for Brisbane. There is um, uh, Kirsty Coventry is 37. Um, she was appointed a minister for sport in her country of Zimbabwe, not politically aligned. And um, Anita de France, um, a vice president, a black American who's been an IOC member for 35 years and led uh, led the fight against President Carter for the Americans to go to the games in 1980, unsuccessfully. But the, all of the other members, and I said that they have two thirds of women, have been elected or appointed to the IOC since 2013. There's a whole new group coming through. The, um, the IOC works with commissions, um, 40, but I think approaching 50% are now chaired by women. The number of um, IOC um, mem members totally is now up to 40. Uh, not so long ago it was 15, 20 per cent. Uh, the IOC executive board must be close to 50, 50. There is a whole group of new um, members um, to represent the IOC being encouraged to join and um, with some quite amazing credentials. The, um, uh, I won't go through them all, but we've got former presidents of countries and, uh, and so on. Um, it is uh, it's not just the old boys network. Uh, so, so how does this change the sort of financial side, though, of, of the Olympics? I mean, it's always been portrayed as, as an issue about, uh, about sponsorship, um, about the broadcast rights. That, those things must be changing in an era, era of uh, streaming services and, uh, and just the fact that there were so many sort of exorbitant bids made. Yes, well, we, um, the bids when, uh, when Sydney and Melbourne last bid were 30 million each. They cost. The um, Tokyo was probably of the order of 50 million. 
we changed the process for bidding so that we said no longer um, will cities um, be allowed to invite IOC met members to come and visit them. No longer will they be allowed to go and visit IOC members and pressure them. The, um, there was uh, caps on, the, um, uh, in, caps on the, the documentation that has to be provided, etc. Um, I, was, uh, I introduced President Bach to um, um, Prime Minister Morrison at the Osaka G20 or 7 <laughs> meeting uh, in 2018. And uh, we had a meeting afterwards. Matthias Cormann was there. And um, the Prime Minister said, well, look, we've committed $10 million for this bid. And the, um, Thomas Bach just leaned over the table and said, save your money. It's not going to cost that. And so the total cost of the Brisbane bid, including feasibility studies by the 12 councils of South East Queensland, including a feasibility study um, by the Queensland Government and including the general work the AOC undertook, uh, will come in at under $10 million. So the, the position was, uh, and then there's a process that you can have uh, when cities are ready, when they have shown that they've they've got a project that stacks up, uh, they can be moved to targeted dialogue. And so there were upwards of um, six cities interested in bidding uh, for 2032, but uh, Brisbane was so far ahead of the rest in terms of the project and the new idea of being able to spread it around rather than have to focus in one city, city and therefore build more venues. So we've got the two, I went through all the, the different um, cities. Um, we were the we moved were moved to targeted dialogue, and um, uh, so then it was a matter of a very extensive due diligence by the IOC Future Host Commission, um, due diligence um, questionnaires that had to be answered, and um, uh, uh, as I say, far more diligent, um, but a, a better outcome for the IOC, and. Um, no, no longer all the losers that we used to have in the past. And um, I'm also on the Rugby World Cup um, advisory bid for 27. And uh, rugby is moving to a similar targeted dialogue. And I think it's far more sensible. The next question is from Olivia Causley. Thanks, Laura, and thanks, John. Olivia Caisley from the Australian newspaper. In the last year, we have seen and heard countless allegations of abuse, grooming, body shaming, bullying and cover-ups in many major sports, including swimming, women's football, gymnastics and hockey. We know that sports cannot be trusted to investigate themselves. Is Sport Integrity Australia the answer or do we need a Royal Commission? Yeah, um, it is terrible, Olivia. We. When um, Peter McClellan was the Royal Commissioner insti into institutional response um, to sexual abuse um, in the church, scouts, other bodies, I rang him and said, look, um, after about a year, have you got any recommendations we can start and feed through to our sports and for the AOC? And he said, well, John, why don't you come along and tell us what you do. And I did. And he then extended that Royal Commission into dealing with institutional responses to abuse in sport. And we were very pleased that he did. And um, I had hoped that um, and there were prosecutions that followed and people were um, dealt with it within sports. And so uh, some cases criminal, some cases um, banned from sports. I'd hope that the, um, that would have been the lesson for the sports, but it seems we, our member sports um, are still, as a whole, to come to grips with this, to understand that um, uh, there is and there's a, an obligation on all of us, the Australian Olympic Committee and the ISC as well, um, we have to provide a safe environment for um, people wanting to practice sport um, and uh, that's um, sadly, it's uh, evidence is coming out that over the years that hasn't happened. The, the IOC, we deal with uh, the athletes when they come together in the Olympic Village. We have uh, formed an entourage group. 
a representative of athletes and others to um, <coughs> uh, look at um, and, and provide guidelines to ensure that abuse doesn't happen. We now have a whistleblower uh, at the Games in the Olympic Village so that um, any athlete, if something happens at the Games, they can go to them. It can be either referred to their National Olympic Committee or, or to their International Federation, or if we're not satisfied, if that independent group is not satisfied that um, it'll be dealt with properly, then it goes to an IOC uh, group. So I, um, I'm, um, and then I'm now reading <laughs> this week uh, more examples of it. Uh, I'm very, very pleased that the Australian government has now uh, established a sport uh, Integrity Australia group to not only now investigate anti-doping, not only to investigate a manipulation of sporting competitions, but to investigate uh, these sorts of abuses. And so um, I'm very, very pleased and I commend the Australian government for that. Has the AOC got a role, though, in terms of just, the, as you say, the IOC has set up a system in villages. Has the AOC got a role to play in sort of putting downward pressure on sports organisations, given some of these horrendous allegations that we've heard, particularly over the last couple of weeks? We do and we do. Um, the, uh, the AOC contractually builds into its team membership agreements an obligation um, um, uh, to um, treat athletes properly. Um, we build in there an obligation to, um, uh, on the officials as well. We, um, we have all of that. Um, and um, uh, when we're aware of something, Laura, um, we will investigate it and have it investigated independently. So the... Um, in the lead up to the 2016 Games in London, there was an episode, episode involving some of our leading swimmers in Manchester. Um, and um, it, they were called, it was to do with the use of still knocks and mixing that with um, uh, other drinks. And um, uh, there were some there was threat, threatening actions against a girl in that team we, we, took, we took that to Brett Walker QC. Um, Brett um, undertook an independent review of that. He got all the athletes in. Uh, he came back and made recommendations um, to deal with that within swimming. Um, so when we're aware, I've, um, I was aware from the uh, Royal Commission into institutional abuse of an issue involving an Australian coach in swimming who then left the country and um, was coaching in Brazil in the lead up to those games. Now, um, there were jurisdictional issues about uh, what we could do, um, but I made it very clear that um, uh, he wouldn't, he would, uh, his life would be very uneasy if uh, they put him on the pool deck and uh, if, was, if he continued to coach during those games. Uh, they didn't pay much attention to it. They had him training somewhere else. But I can say that when he did return to Australia, he was arrested. Uh, so we, um, anyone who brings uh, an, an example of this, Laura, to us, um, if it's a criminal matter, it will go straight to the police. And if it's worthy of, um, if it requires other investigation, uh, I'd like to think um, uh, the Australian gymnastics um, have somewhat led the way with, um, you know, and a sport that's uh, particularly important because of the age of the young athletes, but um, um, following on examples of abuse in America of young children in gymnastics, um, uh, they, they started to appear examples here and the sport um, went, to, went straight to Sport Integrity Australia and said, would you investigate it? Um, the, the key to all of this is going outside the, um, the National Federation or the Australian Olympic Committee and having an investigation and not trying to put it under the carpet. The next question is from Tracy Holmes. 
Thanks for that. Um, John, thank you for speaking to the National uh, Press Club, finally. Um, it, it's a two-part question. The first part is just um, a yes or no answer. Have you ever considered a late career transition into politics? Jeez, it's pretty late, Tracy. Uh, so, no. OK, I'll move on then, because the IOC makes a lot of being a, a, a non-political organisation. Yep. And yet the fact is you do have to deal with governments and politicians of every country in order to get games hosted uh, and organised. And so in that regard, um, you know, commendable for the work that's been done on helping women uh, flee Afghanistan because of the new political regime there. But what about with a country like China and similar human rights abuses against a group of people, the Uyghurs, and the IOC's reluctance to take that on? Yeah, the um, good question. The Olympic movement um, brings together teams from 206 very, very diverse political systems at every games, or every summer games. Um, the IOC doesn't endorse those political systems and um, doesn't uh, because the, that's the sovereign right of the particular countries. The IOC does place a very high emphasis on human rights. Um, you know that it's, it's a, a very important part of the fundamental principles of Olympism, the fundamental principles that are set out in the Olympic Charter. But the IOC is not a is um, the IOC's remit is to ensure that there is no human rights um, abuses in respect of the the conduct of the games within the National Olympic Committees or within the Olympic movement. Um, we have no ability to go into a country and um, tell them what to do. We, all we can do is to uh, award the Olympic Games to a country under conditions set out in a host contract, and Brisbane's got it, and then ensure that they are followed and there are many, many uh, human rights requirements uh, in, in that contract and in the Olympic Charter that have to be followed. But um, it's not our remit and we do not have the ability to go beyond um, uh, the conduct of the Games themselves or the way Olympic committees conduct themselves. And um, uh, I made that clear, Bark, President Bark made that clear too. Uh, we are not a world government. Uh, we have to respect the sovereignty of the countries and, and, uh, who are hosting the Games. Next question is from Mark Ludlow. Hi, John, Mark Ludlow from the Financial Review in uh, Brisbane Olympic City here. Um, I did have a question about the Brisbane Organising Committee. Um, some of us are old enough to remember SOCOG and a lot of political infighting going on there. Michael Knights is a name that springs to mind. Obviously, Brisbane has a longer lead time up into the 2032 Games. Um, and we've already seen argy-bargy between the federal government and the Queensland government about seats on uh, BOCOG or the Brisbane Organising Committee. Um, do you feel that that will settle down and is there potential for more infighting given that there is a longer lead time into the 2032 games or do you think it will settle down? The, um, we won because we had a good project, a very good project that we presented to the IOC. And when we presented it, we were able to present it as a group um, um, where the state government, the federal government, the uh, the City Council and the Olympic Committee and the Paralympic Committee uh, were all in uniformity. We're all supporting each other. We, the difference between SOCOG and the Brisbane Organising Committee is that um, the, for, for Brisbane, the federal and state governments have agreed that outside of the operating costs for the Games, there are a whole range of infrastructure matters that would benefit the Games if they were brought forward. Um, they're things that are on the horizon for 20 years and they'll be brought forward. And the Prime Minister said, well, uh, the, the Premier said, look, I'd like you to um, 
to meet, meet us halfway on this. We're talking of 10 to $11 billion of infrastructure in Queensland. And the Prime Minister um, uh, said, well, if we're going to do that, we want to say in the organising committee that we didn't have in Sydney. The federal government provides uh, security and all of those things, cyber security. Um, but he wanted to say in the appointments, and it was agreed by all of us, that the, there would be representation from the federal government, from the state government, from local government, from the Olympic side uh, and Paralympic side, and then that there would be five other positions, um, one of whom would be the president of the organising committee, the position that Michael Knight had in Sydney. One would be allocated for a First Nations person <coughs> and the others would be uh, three or four independents and all of them um, to be uh, the product of an international, well, a search by international companies. Um, uh, we certainly trust that we'll be able to find Australians to do these jobs and um, also uh, in, in appointing them, uh, there's, we've also agreed that there has to be um, gender diversity uh, in those positions, particularly bearing in mind that um, some of the other uh, representative groups don't have it. So there is a framework um, and we're going through that at the moment and um, it's working its way through and I'm very confident that um, uh, the Premier believes and she's, um, she's been working very closely with the federal government. Her minister um, has been with uh, the federal government. Um, so St Sterling Hinchcliffe and um, Richard Colbeck are working close and they are expecting in the next few weeks to be able to take something to parliament. And um, the, uh, I see no reason why uh, we can't continue in the, uh, the way we are. Um, I've been very much at the middle of the bidding process. Um, the Prime Minister was the chairman of the bid, I was the, the deputy. Uh, my, ch my role has just been to um, make sure that we do present a united front and um, uh, that's what we'll do for the next 11 years. The next question is from Matthew Killeran. Uh, uh, G'day John, thanks for your time. Um, following on from, from Mark's question, um, we have, it's only taken a, a couple of months for that united front presented to the Olympics Committee bid uh, between the, the state government, the federal government and the councils to, to have fallen apart to some extent. Uh, we've seen sort of fighting just not over the positions on the, um, on the council, but the, uh, but, you know, with regards to the GST splitting for, for things like the, the, the South East Queensland um, uh, uh, plan for, for the next 20 years. Is there any risk to Brisbane continuing to host the Games if there continues to be this infighting between the, the state and, and um, federal governments? And sort of along those lines, does the federal government need to consider appointing a minister or cabinet minister to to the Olympic Games to, to make sure that there is that strong voice uh, being heard directly to, to the cabinet? Um, it hasn't fallen apart. The uh, Yes, I saw the, um, the reporting in um, uh, that great paper, the Courier Mail last Saturday, um, of someone suggesting that the, um, the agreement should be torn up. Saturday morning, the Prime Minister rang me and said, I want to assure you, John, that uh, what was said should not have been said. And um, uh, we are working very closely together as the two governance to governments to uh, conclude this legislation. Uh, I have no worry. Um, the, um, you know, the, the, Prime, the Premier rang me and asked my opinion on whether she should be, take on the, the uh, min, uh, position of Minister for the Olympics. And I said, uh, you should. Uh, so far as the Olympic movement's concerned, it means that um, we've got you more committed. And um, it's, uh, Michael Knight was both the President and the uh, Minister for the Olympics. You'll then question, um, should the federal government also uh, elevate the importance of the Games and have a minister? That's a matter for the Prime Minister. Uh, this is probably a bit of a dumb question, but it is a, a long time away. What, what actually happens for the next five or six years? What are you actually going to be doing? <laughs> OK. I'll be, I'll be growing old gracefully. Um, but the, 
um, the, it's really the first three or four years is planning, um, putting in place the, the structures for an organising committee that will grow to about 3,000 people um, and plus 70,000 volunteers. The um, Los Angeles was elected 11 years out and they've managed to keep it very tight, about 60 people at this stage, um, just now starting to make some other appointments and they've been focused very much on the revenue raising, uh, the, the national sponsorships, the, um, uh, you know, the worldwide sponsorships the IOC takes care of, the broadcasting rights, uh, they're taken care of for the Olympic Games, uh, the Paralympics. They still need to um, uh, sell all of the Paralympic broadcasting rights. Uh, but it's, it's very much the first three or four years planning. Um, the, uh, I know within the first six months of being elected, we have to present a, um, a plan to the IOC on um, marketing, um, what the marketing plan is going to be. We also have to do one to the IOC on sustainability and the environmental commitments that we've made as part of the bid. Um, uh, zero net emissions, uh, zero waste, all of those things that they'll hold us accountable to. Um, the, there isn't much that in Australia's case that needs to be done uh, with, the international, with the National Olympic Committees or the international federations. Um, we can do that very well in the shorter timetable, but it's, it's very much planning, but also putting in place the money uh, to pick up, uh, to raise the money. The next question is from Chip Legrand. Uh, hi, Mr Coates. Uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit about what we might very loosely describe as the AOC moving into a post Coates era. Uh, can I check, is it still your intention to stand down as president of the AOC at the next uh, uh, general meeting. Um, and if it is, whether you intend to uh, still accept a consultancy fee for the work that uh, you do for the AOC after that point. And could I ask you about uh, your potential successor, um, whether you have a preferred successor in mind and who that is, and also uh, how that person will be able to establish their own effective leadership of the AOC, given the, the very long shadow that you will continue to cast over all matters uh, Olympics in this country? Yes, it is my intention to uh, retire uh, at the next um, Australian Olympic Committee AGM, but I do remain as a member of the AOC executive uh, by virtue of being the, um, um, an IOC member. Uh, through until the Paris Olympics um, and the and then after that um, it's likely that I'll be made the honorary life president which doesn't carry a position on the AOC executive doesn't carry a voting position within the AOC executive but it will carry influence um, if they want it uh, within the organizing committee and the AOC um, have got a commission uh, looking at um, a remuneration and those things. And uh, my understanding is that um, if I'm to stay involved in the Brisbane, then they would be looking at um, providing me with a consultancy that's of the norm of a non-executive director of, around, of a large company of around $150,000. The By then, you haven't asked my successor. Um, uh, no, I'm, I'm not... Um, anointing anyone, but I do think that from, from amongst the AOC um, uh, executive at the moment, um, there's a, a number of them who could step up and do this. We've got a very, very capable executive, and, um, but um, uh, I expect that they will um, reach a conclusion on uh, who the preferred candidate is going to be and uh, they'll put that candidate forward with all of their support. The next question is from Melissa Woods. Good afternoon, John. Um, yes, Melissa Woods from Australian Associated Press. 
Um, just sort of following on from um, Chip's question, um, you talked of, you know, the length of your uh, administrative career of some 45 years. I just wondered if there was something that you could perhaps highlight that you were particularly proud of. Um, the Olympics, uh, you know, was criticised for perhaps becoming outdated and, uh, and you've spoken of the success of Tokyo. Yeah, is there something in particular that stands out for you as something that um, you're, you're particularly proud of achieving through your career? Thank you. Um, well, the uh, first and foremost is um, playing a significant role in bringing the Games to Australia twice. Um, I was the Vice President of the Sydney BID and Senior Vice President of the Sydney Organising Committee and ran the, the sporting side of it. Um, games that uh, were regarded as um, uh, by Samarans, President Samarans as the best games ever. Um, those opinions vary. Um, so that um, I'm very proud of. Then when um, I joined the IOC, I was appointed there in 2001. And then um, in that position, I've, uh, I'm in my second term as a vice president and I've certainly played a role in um, helping shape what are called the Olympic Agenda 2020, now plus five roadmap, which is um, steering Australia, um, uh, the Olympic movement into the future, and um, uh, which is the ones, for example, that changed the, the method of um, voting for um, voting for cities so that you have a, um, a continuous, uh, continuous dialogue, then targeted dialogue, and taking the cost out of that. Um, the hardest thing I've done in the whole time was um, being chairman of the IOC commission that um, uh, ensured the delivery or the preparation for and delivery of Tokyo 2020 up until the pandemic. Um, that saw me there 35 times in seven years. And then we were doing it um, r remotely. Um, I'm very proud of that and you heard why. And um, then um, finally, uh, I'm very pleased to have played a role in bringing the Olympic Games back to Australia and to Brisbane. The next question is from Jack Snape. Hello, John, thanks for your time today. Uh, you mentioned the uh, election of the independent or the appointment of the independent board members uh, for the Brisbane Organising Committee earlier. Uh, that seems to be a subject of tension between the Commonwealth and state at the moment. Do you think there needs to be uh, independent expressly um, included in the legislation? And what do you think uh, would give the Prime, Prime Minister some confidence that these members are indeed independent? I don't think there is disagreement between the federal government and the state government uh, on the appointment of those five. Uh, it is expressly agreed uh, by the two governments and the other members of the Olympic um, candidature leadership group that um, uh, search firms will be engaged. They will and they will make recommendations. Uh, there will be consultation with um, the different groups. Um, and then a final decision by the Prime Minister and the Premier. I see all that as very seemly and don't see any problems in, uh, in uh, proceeding in that way. The next question is from Tim Shaw. Uh, thanks, Laura. Uh, Tim Shaw, Director of the National Press Club. Mr Coates, there's been a lot of chariot of fire moments in Olympic history. And of course, let's go back to Paris, 1924. Nicholas Whitlam has just written a book, yeah. a guide, Paris 1924. Um, that chariot of fire moment changed the way in which athletes competed. Do you expect the same in Paris 2024? And if I may, uh, following on from the boys in terms of uh, helpful former prime ministers, we've got Malcolm Turnbull off to Glasgow. We've had Tony Abbott in Taiwan. Would you like to see someone like Kevin Rudd from Queensland helping out with the uh, with the organising committee of the Brisbane Olympics? But to Paris first. Yeah, I've got the book, and I gave Nicholas a, a hand with um, uh, some of the research. He did a book on the 1936 Olympic simile, 
and we helped him with that and um, I plan to read it uh, shortly. Um, whether there will be a chariots of fire moment, I don't know. Um, but the, um, they have uh, got a wonderful plan. Uh, they're using the city and a lot of its iconic venues as backdrops for different sports. They are, as well as running sports, they're very, you know, they're going to run events off the back of the sport. So the marathon may take place, will take place, and then there'll be a, uh, off the back of that, a marathon for the people of Paris during the games. There'll be participation opportunities uh, say at the, if it's on the program again, the skateboarding, um, you'll see the, um, the best of the world and then the, the local kids can come and have a go. So, Tim, um, uh, let's see what happens. Um, then, um, as for uh, future, um, using our future Prime Ministers, the head of the organising committee for Tokyo um, was Professor y was Yoshiro Mori and a former Prime Minister and um, we became very close. Um, he had to fall on his sword over some unfortunate um, uh, comments he made, but he had a very input. He was he was 82. Uh, he's 82 now, and um, he was very very important to those games because he was a mentor to Prime Minister Abe and to uh, Suga, and um, I uh, I enjoyed working with him very much, and as I would with any of the people you've mentioned. But I I actually think that. The better model, and I wrote to the, um, uh, my colleagues on the, um, the Olympic Canada Leadership Group recently and said, have a look at recent history. Seb Coe was the president of the London 2012 Olympics at an age where he had um, teenage children, double gold medalist. Then um, we had... Uh, put aside the uh, China and Brazil. Um, then we go to um, Los Angeles. They've got a guy, Casey Wasserman, who's in his 40s, um, young family. Uh, and then the Paris, their president has just come off a term as the, on the IOC Athletes Commission. He's a, I think, three times Olympic canoe slalom champion. And um, uh, he was just coming into retirement as he led their bid, and now they've made him the head of their organising committee, and he's managing all of the politicians in that country. And um, the example I gave to our people was, um, find someone who, as he did in the closing ceremony of the Paralympic Games, who'll come out on stage in a, um, um, in a, in a tight t black T-shirt, jump up on the stage and, um, uh, be an example to the people of Paris and to the youth of the world of um, the importance of the games for young people. So, Tim, if, um, if the Prime Ministers you've mentioned are capable of doing that, I'm sure they'll be considered. Um, Kevin Rudd in a tight T-shirt. Um, so, uh, one final question, which is once again goes to politics, uh, Mr Coates. You talked about Afghanistan and the pride you had in the role um, the Olympic movement had in getting some of those uh, athletes mm. out of Afghanistan. What's the difference between intervening somewhere like that where the Games aren't being held and taking some sort of stand in Games where... Uh, in places where Games are being held? I suppose what I've got in mind here is we've got a, a lot of rising tension uh, between our two countries, between Australia and China. There are obviously big problems for the Uyghurs and other minority groups in China. How do you draw the distinction about what you say and what you don't say? They're very easy. The work that the IOC is doing is to protect the Olympians and the Olympic, those involved in the Olympic movement, those who were at the Games, those who comprise the sports federations in Afghanistan. Um, the, uh, that's within our remit. Um, the, uh, the situations that you've referred to, the humanitarian ones in China, is not within our remit. Mr Coates, thanks so much for talking to us today and thank you also to all of our, uh, my colleagues from uh, the National Press Club and other journalists uh, for their questions. Uh, we'll see you again uh, next week.